too much. Now, whereas Estalaja is suspected of being the first black Latino to play in the major leagues, the first one that we all recognize and was treated as such was Minnie Minoso, Orestes Minoso. If you notice this picture down here, he actually started his career in the United States playing in the Negro Leagues on that team, the New York Cubans. He played three seasons in the Negro Leagues before he was, his contract was sold to the Cleveland Indians. And in April of 1949, he would be the first black Latino officially recognized to play in the major leagues. And in 1951, May 1st, 1951, it will be the very first time that he would be the first black player in, on the Chicago team. So he integrated the Chicago White Sox in 1951. Fast forward, by the way, in January, we are hoping to host him to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Minoso breaking the color line. And more information on that will be posted via the MLK Celebration uh, website here on campus. But here you see two quotes of Minoso. One, he was astonished that his African-American teammates would often say that he was not black. And part of that was rooted in the different tactics that he took towards dealing with race. But the second quote also notes that Minoso didn't arrive to the United States as a blank slate. He had experience of race in Cuba. And so he talks about how those signs that read, you know, colored or white only also affected him. He was indeed a black Latino. And that's part of the story that often gets forgotten in this telling of the story of segregation and race in baseball. The particular ways in which Latinos, and more specifically, black Latinos, were affected. Roberto Clemente spoke it plainly to Roger Kahn in one particular interview. He said he felt he was a double N-word. Because he was black and because he was Puerto Rican, he was treated more harshly. And if you look at how the Pittsburgh press dealt with Clemente till 1971 when he had this glorious World Series, the Pittsburgh press was not too kind at all to Clemente. They made fun of his language, they made fun of his ailments, his human frailties, you know, there's, there's a whole series of stories there. Um, and that's not to kind of just to deify Clemente and say he was God, he was wonderful and all these things, but rather to note that the, the best player on the Pirates, the absolute star of the team, was still treated through a racial lens. He was still treated through an ethnic filter on how the sports writers wrote about him. And if you read the columns of Wendell Smith in the Pittsburgh Courier and others in the Pittsburgh Courier and compare them to the Pittsburgh News Gazette, you'll notice a difference in tone and how Clemente is treated. So how his accents presented, all this was a way of noting that he was foreign. But Clemente himself acknowledged, it wasn't just that I was foreign, it's also because I was black. So how did these Latino players who gained access to you know, aspire to that American dream, particularly in baseball, to be that big league hero, to dream to be more than just a Sandlot player, to leave your native society, to go forth to the United States? This was the big leagues. Let me give you a back story to Minnie Minoso playing in the Negro Leagues. In 1945, there was um, Jorge Pascual, who was an oil tycoon in Mexico, who was the money behind the Mexican League, basically offered Minoso $10,000 over three years, guaranteed money, if you were to come and play in the Mexican League. And Minoso decided, I'd rather go to the Negro Leagues because if one day they do really open up the major leagues to us, I want to be right there. And so he Instead, it was making $250 a month playing with the New York Cubans because the pay scale was very different in the Negro Leagues versus what was going on in the Mexican League. And Minoso ends up going into the Negro Leagues. Well, who's the guy that signed Minoso? It's this gentleman right here, Alex Pompez. Alex Pompez was born in Key West, Florida, grew up in Tampa, 
And for those who were in my class, you heard part of this yesterday about the importance of Key West and Tampa. Um, Afro-Cuban American. He owned a Negro League team from 1916 to 1950 when his New York Cubans were dismantled. The New York Giants immediately signed him to be their scout. And they used him to sign Cepeda, Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, Juan Marichal, Felipe Alou, I can go on and on and on. He was their connection. And he was also someone who sought to teach the players how to deal with race in the United States, how to become a man in the United States. Because a lot of these guys, like Cepeda, came here, he was 18 years old, first time out of Puerto Rico. You know, some of the young Dominicans that he signed. Pompez extended the talent pool into places that the major leagues had never gone before. He signed a guy out of the Bahamas. And one of the important things about Pompez is, I argue, that he used this transnational vision. His idea of who's a Latino, his idea of where we belong, um, extended beyond his, native, his parents' native Cuba, extended beyond Cubans, and reached out to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. He actually opened Dominican Republic twice to U.S. professional baseball. He did it in the Negro Leagues. In 1926, he signed the first Dominican to play professionally in the United States. His name was Pedro Alejandro San. Fast forward, 1950s, we will see him sign, as I noted before, Marshall, the Alou brothers, and once again reopen the Dominican Republic. No Dominican had ever played, Dominican native, had ever played in major leagues till the Giants started pulling this talent out of. And the way he did it, was by using his Latino identity. He was bilingual. He was multicultural. And he sought to counsel the players. Alou um, still remembers, and Manny Mota and others still remember spring training days where Pompez would put them to the side and talk to them in the hotel lobbies about how to deal with the reality of life, of segregation in the United States. Now here we see Pompez that, again, backstory. Alex Pompez had made his initial wealth in the United States as a numbers king. That is, running the illegal lottery in, in Harlem. There was a group of individuals who were called the numbers king because they held the dominant position. And so when he says they can't change the law, he's kind of dealing with the experience here about having been on the wrong side of the law, having been incarcerated on numerous occasions, and almost outright having his liberty taken for a period of five to seven years and say he turns state's evidence. And that's in the, that's in the book, as Jose Canseco.